Hello and welcome to Chapter 1 in Introduction to Physical Geology here at OTC. My name is Jim Caffey and I'll be your instructor for this course. These videos will be uh, posted both inside Blackboard in the Lessons tab for each chapter and also linked to my YouTube page which is Professor Jim Caffey. So you can go to either one of those, either on YouTube, Professor Jim Caffey, or you can go on to the lessons page and you'll find these. And these will be all put in the instructions and the announcements. Well, let's get started. This is a nice picture I found. It's actually a stock picture from Windows. I'll admit I cheated. And it's our banner page for you'll see on top of the announcements every time we go into. And uh, nice beautiful red rocks there to demonstrate our geology. And yeah, you got when you go on vacation, you got to get a selfie. So here's my selfie of me in front of uh, the Red Rocks in Sedona, Arizona. And uh, this is actually next to a church built into the rocks. I uh, found it very beautiful and peaceful there in Sedona. Lots of beautiful red rocks. And you can see, even in this picture, you can see sedimentary layers, different colored layers into the rocks. We'll get into that more in a minute. What is the science of geology? Geology is the science that pursues an understanding of planet Earth. And there are two types that we look at. We have physical geology, which examines Earth materials and seeks to understand the many processes that operate our planet. Historical geology is kind of like an archaeologist, seeks to understand the origin of the Earth and its development through time. And I think both of these are very important areas in geology. Now we know that people in geology were well connected. Uh, this was very evident in my recent trip to Arizona. We went to a place called Tutsikut, which was uh, Indian ruins built into the rocks uh, there in the desert of Arizona. And we can see in Montezuma Castle also pictures of uh, dwellings built into the rocks to protect the, the people from the uh, sun's rays and the heat of the day in the, in the hot desert sun. We know that problems are addressed by geology, including natural hazards, resources, world population growth, and environmental issues are concerning to us in geology. When we look at geological time, we look at not yesterday or today, or even a week ago, we look at millions and millions, even billions of years involved in the making of these things. So an appreciation of the magnitude of geological time is important because many of these processes are very, very gradual over millions and billions of years. We know that the nature of the Earth has been a focus of study for centuries. This has been going on for a very long time. One of the topics we look at is uniformitism, which is the physical, chemical, and biological laws that operate today have operated throughout the geologic past for millennia. Geologists are now able to assign fairly accurate dates to events in Earth history. We do this by two different ways. We can look at relative dating, which means the dates are placed in their proper sequence or order without knowing their specific age. We also can look at superposition, which is the sequence of sedimentary rocks or lava flows, the youngest layer on the top and the oldest layer on the bottom. And we will see this here on the picture of the Grand Canyon. So we can see the different layers of the rocks here from top to bottom and you can see the different colors and structures of these different layers over millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years to form this structure. We can also look at the principle of fossil succession. These are fossil organisms that succeeded one another in a definite and determinable order. Therefore, any time period can be recognized by its fossil content. We know that the Ozark Plateau at one point was uh, an ocean. We can see fossil remnants of ocean life in the rocks that we see here in the Ozarks. Now this is a very, very busy uh, map here, graph. This is actually in your book and we'll look at this in the future. But just point out here, there are various eras and epochs and periods that define different times in geological history. A lot of these big chunks came in during catastrophic events like uh, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs uh, and other catastrophic events like that. And that goes back four, four and a half billion years. Well, let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about how we do science. 
So science assumes the natural world is consistent and predictable. The goal of science is to discover patterns in nature and use the knowledge to make predictions. And then we use observations to make these measurements and predictions. So one of the first things we need to do is come up with a hypothesis. This is an educated guess. It's a first attempt to figure things out. It's a tentative or untested explanation. A theory, though, is a well-tested and a widely accepted view that the scientific community agrees best on observational facts. And so we have scientific methods in gathering facts through observations, formulating the hypothesis, the educated guess, and theories. There really is no fixed path that scientists follow that leads us to scientific knowledge, but we do use the scientific method as a, as a guidepost to give us some guidance. Let's take a look at the view of the Earth now. The Earth is a planet, a small planet really relatively compared to other bigger planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Self-contained, contains four areas or spheres to it. We have the hydrosphere, which is the water, the atmosphere, the air, the biosphere, the living organisms on Earth, and then the geosphere, which is the Earth itself, the rock. Here's a picture from Apollo 17 taken on the way to the moon in the early 70s by the three Apollo astronauts. They can look back at the Earth. The Earth can be thought of as a system. It's a dynamic planet with many interacting parts or spheres. And Earth system science tells us that these systems have subsystems or interacting parts to them. And so we, we employ an interdisciplinary approach using various areas of science, geology, physics, astronomy, Earth science, space science, biology and chemistry to solve global environmental problems we incur. So what is a system? It's any size group of interacting parts that form a complex whole and these can be open or closed systems. We can look at feedback mechanisms. So we look at negative feedback which means that everything stays the same. We, we don't change anything in negative feedback. And then there's positive feedback which enhances or drives these changes. Well, we have cycles in the Earth system too. So we have the hydrological cycle, the water cycle we looked at, and the rock cycle. How rocks go from being magma to igneous or sedimentary rocks or metamorphic rocks. And then we have an interface between boundaries. And this is where different parts of a system come in contact and interact with each other. So here's the interface between those two cycles. The hydrologic, the water, and the rock cycles. Water evaporates out of the ocean goes into clouds and condensates. Water rains down in the form of rain and storms and uh, fills up the lakes and rivers and gullies. And those rivers then drain back into uh, lakes and oceans. And the cycle keeps continuing. And during the cycle, we weather rocks by the action of water and friction. We deposit sediment and the whole thing continues over again. So we've looked at uh, the different spheres of the Earth the Earth system is powered in two ways, by the sun, which is the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and at the Earth's surface powers that. And then the Earth system is also powered by the interior through the heat of the core and the magma that comes up through the Earth's surface. The inside of the Earth is actually very warm. Let's look at the early evolution of Earth, how the Earth formed in its early years four and a half billion years ago. Most researchers believe that Earth and other planets in our solar system formed at essentially at about the same time. And we call this theory the nebular hypothesis. If you've had an astronomy class, you may have heard it called the solar nebula theory. And so I may use those two kind of combined. The nebular hypothesis says that the solar system evolved from an enormous rotating cloud called the solar nebula. This cloud had gas and dust in it, composed mainly of hydrogen and helium for the gas, and it began to contract and, and spin about five billion years ago. The nebula hypothesis continues to say that it assumes a flat disk shape with a proto-sun, the start of a sun, baby sun, at its center where all the heavy metals went to. The inner planets began to form from metallic and rocky substances and then the larger outer planets began to form from what we call ices, water ice, carbon dioxide ice, and other volatiles like methane. 
So here's the solar nebula theory. Big cloud of gas and dust rotating, just flattens out into a disk. We get these little eddies forming, like spinning whirlpools in a lake or a river. And those start to form the planets that we have today. So let's look at the structure of the Earth. We know that in the formation of the Earth, it formed in layers. The metals sink to the center to form the core. Molten rock rose to produce a primitive crust. And we have a mantle, which is kind of like a plastic. It's warm, it flows, and if it's cold, it, it's solid. Chemical segregation established the three basic divisions in the Earth's interior, core, mantle, and crust. And then a primitive atmosphere evolved from the gases that were outgassing from the interior of the Earth. So the layers we've defined as the crust, mantle, and core. We live on the crust. It's the thinnest layer, kind of like the skin on an apple. The mantle is kind of like the meat of the apple. And then the core is the seeds in the apple, and that deep down in the middle. And we can define these layers by physical properties, the lithosphere, athenosphere, mesosphere, and the inner and outer core. So let's take a look at those layers. We have the crust, which is like the skin of an apple, the mantle, that plastic that flows when it's hot and it's solid when it's cold. And then we have two cores, a liquid outer core of iron and nickel and the solid inner core. And it's that liquid outer core of iron and nickel spinning as the earth spins that generates the dynamo effect, which is what we use the term our magnetic field around the, around the earth. And that's what causes things like the northern lights. Well, what does the face of the Earth look like? We know we have continents, there are seven of them, and we have oceans. So the continents have mountain belts on them, the most prominent feature on continents. We have a stable interior for most of the continents, called a craton, composed of shields and stable platforms. Kind of like in the center of the United States, there's no mountains found, and you got the Rockies, and you got the Appalachians on either side. So here we have the Canadian Shield up in Canada, the Appalachian Mountains on the East Coast, and the Himalayan mountains. Well then we also have the oceans. And the oceans have two areas, the continental margins, which is kind of the, the area as you slope off from the beach into the water. Uh, on the west coast uh, off of California, it's a very sharp shelf, very sharp deep slope. You go off the water and you immediately go down quite a bit of ways. And then we have uh, deep ocean basins which are the abyssal plains, the oceanic trenches like the Marianas Trench in the Pacific, and seamounts. In the oceanic ridge system, the most prominent feature would be the ridges. So we have the mid-Atlantic ridge between North and South America and Europe, Africa. And this ridge is composed of igneous rock that has been fractured and uplifted. Now this is very important right here, so here at the 13 and the quarter mark, let's make sure we know this stuff really well because these are the three types of rocks we're going to talk about in this class. So we have three types, the igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks. The igneous rocks are formed from molten rock, molten rock and lava, we call that magma. It's magma when it's below the surface and it's lava above the surface, same thing. So we cool and solidify that magma, that molten rock. And examples of this would be granite and basalt. Basalt is volcanic rock you see in Hawaii. The sedimentary rocks accumulate in layers at the Earth's surface. And sediments are derived from a weathering process of pre-existing rocks. So here's an example of a granite rock, an igneous rock in Yosemite National Park in California. We know that uh, sedimentary rocks, some of these include sandstone and limestone. We'll show you a picture of sandstone here in a minute. And limestone rock, we have a lot of these here in the Ozarks because we have a lot of caves. And caves form out of dissolving water and uh, minerals into limestone. And in your rock kit, you'll have some limestone we can look at. Metamorphic rocks is the third type. And all metamorphic rocks come from either igneous or sedimentary rocks. They're formed by changing the pre-existing rocks into metamorphic rocks. And the driving force behind this is lots of heat and lots of pressure. Lots of it. Examples of this include marble. So here's a sandstone rock from Zion National Park in Utah. 
You can see the grainy nature of the rocks and the sand compacted together into layers. And the rock cycle, just like the hydrological cycle, is a loop that involves the processes by which one rock changes to another and illustrates the various processes that we have both outside the earth on the surface and then inside the earth. So just like the hydrological cycle, here's the rock cycle. Magma come up, comes up from the bottom, comes to the top to the surface and makes lava. The lava makes rocks, crystallizes and hardens and cools to form igneous rocks. They can sediment together to form sedimentary rocks and then compact together to form metamorphic rocks. And you see the, the whole example just continues and continues and continues. Well, that's all I have for chapter one. Be sure to review this video if you need to in the future. It's both on YouTube at Professor Jim Caffey and on our lessons page. I'll see you next time.